and uh, we are recording. So, Stefan, whenever you are ready, you can start. Great. Okay. Thanks for joining another episode of the Summer of Open Data. My name is Stefan Verholst. I'm the co-founder of GovLab, and I'm delighted today to join to have Audrey Jan Tang join the Summer of Open Data. The Summer of Open Data is an effort to really look into the current state of open data and data collaboration. Specifically, we are interested to learn how traditional open source principles are being applied across the open data ecosystem. Also, very interested to learn how we can unlock private data assets in order to inform public interest decisions. And obviously, how can we do all of this while ultimately establishing a new sense of data responsibility and data equity? And so today we will discuss some of those issues with Audrey Tang. And I have uh, uh, the pleasure to ask Audrey Tang to introduce herself. I mean, Audrey, you have a long list here of titles, including Minister Without Portfolio, but that might have changed since the bio was shared with me. So Audrey, perhaps if you could uh, uh, explain uh, very briefly uh, what your current position is, what your seeking to do, and then we can dive in uh, into the Summer of Open Data questions. Okay, uh, I'm Audrey Tong. My current position is International Advisor Board member of the GovLab. Well, exactly. uh, and, and exactly. things, well, other things. <laughs> <laughs> and a board member of Digital Future Society Radical Exchange, the Council of Democracy Foundation. And my day job is Taiwanese Digital Minister in charge of social innovation and open government. Great. Brilliant. Thanks for uh, indeed uh, alerting everyone that you are, and we are so delighted to have you on the International Advisory Board to GovLab. And um, so let me start with um, uh, COVID-19, uh, which is of course on everyone's uh, mind. And uh, uh, if you look at the coverage of uh, Taiwan and COVID-19, quite often we see the headlines that Taiwan has hacked the pandemic. And so what do we mean by hacking the pandemic, uh, and specifically, what was the role of open mm -hmm. data towards hacking right. the uh, pandemic as such? Yes, uh, I think uh, it's been a uh, hundred days, more than a hundred days, since we have the last locally confirmed case. We're firmly post pandemic now. Uh, and uh, what we have done uh, is to make use of the open data ecosystem to make sure that people can build their own applications uh, to give participatory accountability. For example, I, I just uh, went to the convenience store, uh, collect a pack of nine medical masks, uh, and uh, each pharmacy currently distributing these medical masks uh, provides uh, updated, like every three minutes, account of how much adults mask how many uh, children's masks do they have in store? And if you go to the pharmacy, swipe your national health uh, insurance card, you can with um, more than 140 visualizations apps, voice assistant and chatbots, uh, ensure that the person queuing after you uh, will actually help you check the validity of the system because they, after a couple of minutes, they can just refresh and see that, oh, you're an adult. So the um, pharmacy stock reduced by nine in the adult section. Uh, if you're a child, then it reduced by 10 in the children's section because that's a quota every two weeks. Of course, nowadays we've also opened up a free trade purchase of masks on the uh, market, but uh, for a while during the pandemic, it was rationed and uh, trading was banned. Great. And, um, and so you're also really known for actually really tapping into a collaborative spirit, which uh, uh, somewhat gets referred to on the kind of open source way of uh, going about solving a public problem. So, so tell us a little bit about how you applied, having uh, spent for years in the open source movement, how you have applied some of those open source principles to actually the current job that you are holding. 
the main insight uh, of uh, the open source movement uh, when they first started forking uh, from the free software movement, um, now it's merging back in. But when they started to fork uh, around the turn of the century, the main insight was that it doesn't have to be a human right argument. It could be an economic argument. For example, Netscape Navigator, at that time a proprietary private database and code base, uh, if they publish both uh, as a public commons, uh, then it enabled uh, not only the Netscape Navigator team to implement uh, features, but also uh, would enable a lot of extensions, a whole ecosystem of people uh, gathering around the code base, which the open source community uh, called Mozilla. And nowadays, um, nobody uses Netscape Navigator anymore, except in emulators, I guess. Uh, but uh, we still use uh, Firefox. Uh, and in fact, my phone uh, still runs uh, the Kai OS, which is a direct descendant uh, from the uh, original uh, Mozilla and Firefox uh, code bases as an operating system for the Nokia phone. And so uh, the main insight is that it reduces costs for everybody and it can uh, generate unexpected applications. And both uh, are present in the open data, data collaborative landscape as well. If you open up the data from the private sector point of view, uh, you attract people who improve the quality of the data data, who would then go to you and say, if you apply these principles, these tools, you can have a higher quality of data. And that's the hardest part. I mean, it's not hard to increase the velocity of data or volume of data. You just buy more sensors. Uh, but the veracity, that is to say the quality of data, can only be improved by careful curation and um, like with the open source saying, there's uh, a saying by Linus Torvalds that says, uh, when there's enough eyes looking at it, all bugs are shallow. And that is the first thing is about the veracity. And the second thing is about enabling unlikely unforeseen applications. For example, uh, when we convince the pharmacies to publish those data, nobody would predict that people would build analysis systems that uh, basically analyze the uh, oversupply and undersupply in selected uh, districts. Whereas most of Taiwan, we have a pretty good supply demand uh, match. In certain areas, there's no such match. And people would then investigate and get to the bottom of why. For example, people work very long hours. And so uh, by the time they got, get off work, all the pharmacy gets closed. That's why we need to partner with convenience stores. And uh, for example, there may be unequal distribution, in which case we'll have to enlist more health institutions other than pharmacies in that particular area as well. But all of this is built upon this kind of like distributed ledger, uh, people seeing uh, every 30 seconds at a time uh, which pharmacies are indeed suffering from oversupply or undersupply. Cool. And, um, and so Focusing on data collaboratives, uh, Audrey, so last year uh, you engaged in an experiment around a presidential data collaborative uh, initiative. And so, uh, and, and, and so, as you know, GovLab has done a lot of work around the concept of data collaboration, where we really try to understand what are new mechanisms and models to match demand and supply. And so can you tell us a little bit about the initiative that uh, took place last year? What uh, was the value for, for instance, also uh, how you went about COVID-19, or more, more importantly, how do we scale this, which is always uh, uh, one of the biggest challenges is to actually really make this sustainable and systematic. Do you want to scale it up, scale it out, or scale it deeply? <laughs> Because these are different <laughs> strategies. Okay. <laughs> Whatever you feel is needed. <laughs> okay, okay, right. Um, the presidential hackathon, which is the third year running now, uh, we are holding the presidential hackathon. Uh, the international track just uh, started um, a couple of weeks ago. The domestic track, we're down to the top 10, uh, but it's a um, interesting configuration of uh, an annual three month prototyping session with all the three sectors that always results in working public sector improvements. And so the idea is that every year our president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, gives five trophies to five teams. And the trophy is a microprojector 
uh, and with the shape of Taiwan, I think it's glass this year. And if you turn it on, it projects uh, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen handing you the trophy. So it's very meta, it's a self-describing trophy. Uh, and with the promise that whatever you did in the past three months will become our national policy, our national priority in the next 12 months. And so it's uh, executive branch binding power as presidential hackathon award. Uh, and so this prompts a lot of people to propose very interesting ideas. For example, um, there was uh, an idea around making sure that people uh, who uh, measure their water quality can do so very easily using a zero G network uh, and a device called Waterbox that is solar powered. And they uh, proposed that last year because uh, we have a new law last year that says if there's any in the uh, arable land, in the agricultural lands, if you have a plant, that is the industrial plant that pollutes the uh, waterways of plants, that's an organic plant, uh, then uh, the central government can cancel your uh, water and electricity supply. And so the uh, manufacturers uh, who uh, lives within the um, arable lands are all very eager to prove that they did not pollute the waterways. Uh, it's actually their upstream, they say, but it's hard to uh, know without continuous monitoring. And so the idea of such a data collaborative is that uh, not only farmers, not only scientists, but actually the people who are in those factories who insist that it's not them, it's somebody upstream, will be prompted to purchase such very inexpensive boxes that rise to this distributed ledger uh, continuously with the main three uh, pollutants uh, in the water. And very quickly then we can have a map that maps out uh, the uh, water quality and find out which river is actually being polluted and handle the spikes in a much more timely manner. And they build upon the community called Airbox, which is doing the same thing for air pollution uh, for around five years now. Uh, again, with very inexpensive, less than 100 US dollars per box in the primary schools, in their balconies and so on. Again, writing to a distributed ledger, again, showing uh, the government where are the pollutants. And the government actually entered into a negotiation because of the presidential hackathon. Uh, and the president really liked the idea. And we also worked with the industrial parks so that they would agree, well, they couldn't disagree, but they would consent to uh, that we uh, use those micro sensors on the lamps. So it's a smart lamp, but it doesn't do face recognition or anything like that. It just measures the air quality so that people can complete a piece of puzzle because the primary school teachers probably cannot break and enter industrial parks to install such air boxes. And so this uh, community sensing then prompts uh, new applications, novel applications, for example, advisories for people who uh, wouldn't um, work well if they go outdoor in sport, like running and so on, but if they have a condition that a high uh, PM 2.5 uh, or a heat or whatever uh, would interfere with their system, they can check it beforehand and so on. There's many applications once you have this very fine-grained data around air pollution and now on water pollution. Great. Um, wow, that's a great example. And um, I do want to go uh, a little bit on the um, on the technical side here, because um, you've mentioned now twice already uh, distributed ledger technology. And uh, mm -hmm. in, ma in many cases, blockchain has is quite often still positioned as uh, not ready for showtime. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so it seems like you already have uh, uh, both at the case of the uh, masks and the pharmaceutical uh, industry, and then also in the case of now the water pollution, uh, you, you already have experience on how actually uh, uh, blockchain or distributed ledger technology can actually be applied to instill a certain kind of trust in the system. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because quite often we actually are still looking for compelling examples on how DLT and open data provides uh, for uh, a solution. 
Sure. Um, I say DLT instead of blockchain, uh, yeah. precisely because Airbox, I think, initially used EOTA, uh, which is uh, technically speaking a cyclic graph, not really a chain. Uh, and, so, and, and so to me, like DLT and blockchain is like search engine and Google. Uh, this is generalized idea and this specific implementation. So I usually say DLT. Um, and, and we use DLT really just for its most mundane use. Uh, which is this multiple writer uh, and immutable ledger, and that, that, that's it. And you can easily implement pretty much the same thing uh, using Git. Uh, and Git, in that sense, is also a distributed ledger. If you have sufficient number, like more than 100 developers hosting their own Git mirrors uh, of the um, mask availability, uh, that's a uh -huh. distributed ledger, because if people right. want to rebase the tree or force push something the other people would know. And, and because of that, um, Git is as good as a distributed ledger uh, as, say, uh, Ethereum for that, because we're all developers and we all keep each other honest. Of course, there's no smart contract or so on, um, but I guess you can um, implement that using commit hooks. Uh, never, no, never mind. So in any case, uh, there's no smart contract and so on. This is purely a database uh, that anyone can host a mirror and people can see for themselves that nobody can go back and rewrite history without every other people people's uh, permission. And that is the most mundane way of using DLT, and that's exactly the way we're using it. Great, great, excellent, and thanks for that uh, explanation. So let's go to the other, uh, and connect that also with open data, the other innovation that uh, uh, you are well known uh, for, which is this uh, new way of engaging citizens as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so we have Taiwan V as a model of uh, uh, mm -hmm. how to in uh, conduct deliberation mm -hmm. and then really uh, achieve a certain kind of uh, uh, citizens' uh, uh, input. Um, so, so question to you, Audrey, is how how can we engage citizens? I mean, you already gave an example, actually, but how can we engage citizens in an ongoing way around open data? I mean, so here mm -hmm. uh, at GovLab, we are trying uh, something around citizens' assembly around data in order to really engage with citizens around the use of data for COVID-19 in New York City, but eager to learn other examples from your end, uh, mm -hmm. what's the potential of deliberation uh, uh, in the context of open data with regard to what questions one should seek mm -hmm. to answer or with regard to the data that, uh, or, or the expectations of people about their data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so uh, first of all, I think their data um, is uh, an interesting uh, angle, an interesting beginning point. When I talk about mask, about rivers, about air quality, there's one thing in common, is that it's not their data. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the mask doesn't have uh, a, a subjectivity, last I checked. Hello. Uh, and, right, uh, and so, and so uh, Musk would, would not uh, say that they have personhood and that they would uh, refrain from sharing how much of them are still in stock. They would not resist being profiled. This is a, a mask of this design. This is a mask of that design. They, they wouldn't mind. Right. So um, there's no um, bias injustice uh, when we're talking about the amount of musk or about air quality or about water quality. Um, and so that sort of, uh, which I would call a public use data or environmental data um, is one thing uh, and personal data quite the other thing. Uh, and so I think the main uh, Taiwanese insight uh, is that we do not confuse these two. Uh, we, we say numbers for like statistics for evidence-based policymaking, we say shu zhu, um, literally numeric evidence. Uh, and then a personal data, we say good uh, personal data. And, and these two uh, pairs of, <coughs> sorry, these two pairs of um, like uh, dual syllable uh, words do not have any thing in common. It doesn't share the same root uh, at all, right? One, one, one side is called evidence and, and one side is called personal data. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, my, my main point is that just this uh, distinction needs to be deliberated. There's uh, sometimes people would say, oh, but for the locally confirmed cases, surely their travel history belongs to the evidence part because everybody would benefit from learning of where they have been. But then our Central Epidemic Command Center has to push back saying that no, 
even if we just put, uh, publish a set of histories, uh, that is to say places and dates, it's easy actually for people to then uh, re-identify and find out who actually that have been. And maybe um, they would feel pressure. They would feel that uh, the society um, doesn't like them. And so if uh, one or two cases like that happen, uh, then the next one who develop a symptom would not report uh, to a local clinic. Uh, and that will actually um, make uh, put at all of us in danger. And so they insist that this is personal. This is not uh, statistics. It's not a, a evidence for policy making and so on. And so we had a deliberative conversation around a tool called POLIS that will uh, just ask everyone, what do you think is the norm around this particular area of data? And in COHEC, the TW, we asked five broad areas of questions about people's norms. For example, the one I just mentioned is about contact tracing, but there's also another one around, say, um, hospitalization, ICU capacity, and so on. And so when people proposed a uh, statement, like um, there was a proposal that said, I feel that we need to develop a tool that uh, triage people who go to ICU, uh, not by the time they arrive or by the severity, but by their estimated remaining contribution to the society. Uh, and then we only treat those with a higher remaining estimated contribution to the society. And that's very divisive. Uh, half of people who participated, usually from the American side, so it's a good idea uh, and pretty much everyone from the Asia I think it's a terrible idea uh, it's against the law in Taiwan by the way <laughs> but but uh, I mean that's fine I mean every jurisdiction have their own norms but the great thing about polis is that instead of this developing into a flame war which I see a lot of potential uh, there is no reply button so uh, the only thing you can do uh, if you disagree is to click disagree, see yourself, your avatar move toward a different camp a little bit, but then see what unifies the camps together and then propose your own ideas that then uh, works with the different camps. And the police automatically summarizes the conversation. So by the end of it, we have a set of ideas that are, um, I would uh, say it's universal norm, no matter which part of the earth you're on, you think is a pretty good idea. And so uh, one of the five winners of the Kohak hackathon uh, is someone called uh, My Data Taiwan, and mm -hmm. they developed a uh, logboard. The logboard log is a app that collects your whereabouts, your temperature, symptom, and whatever, but it works only in airplane mode, meaning that even if you have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and 4G and 5G, it doesn't transmit any data anywhere. It's only used uh, for communication is that when the contact tracer do come to you for an interview, you can, with one click, generate the kind of evidence they need to do their work without revealing any private details of you or your family. Uh, in a way, it protects your own best interest of privacy while working minimally with the contact tracer. Uh, and it also saves you from uh, having to remember where you have been for the past 14 days. And that's a privacy enhancing technology. And this can only be done after everybody who participate agree and settle on a norm that is actually privacy enhancing. Great. And so, uh, so you mentioned there were five uh, areas. So you had contact tracing, mm -hmm. you had ICU. That's right. so, yes. Uh, were there other uh, areas that you feel were enlightening to, to get uh, uh, in, uh, norm setting uh, exercises? Sure. Right. So uh, the five uh, settings is the first one is how to manage community resources. Uh, that includes ICU and also PPE, uh, which I already talked about. Uh, and uh, another one is about um, establishing proper data-driven risk communication, predicting future pandemic outbreaks, uh, supporting frontline staff and essential workers, and then uh, protecting the vulnerable groups. Also, oh, I, I uh, forgot one. There's one that's uh, saying, uh, now we're post-pandemic, how do we make a smooth transition? To a new norm. Cool, cool, um, great. And so the other element, um, and we will definitely uh, check these out as well, uh, Audrey. The other element that we quite often hear, uh, uh, in addition to the data equity, data uh, responsibility, which anyway we believe is should be part of actually an, the third wave of open data to have actually a more sophisticated kind of conversation about, which of course uh, uh, you have alluded to by making that distinction between the different types of data as well. Uh, but the other uh, area that we quite often hear is the need for uh, new skills within government 
uh, new kind of positions uh, in order to really understand what the role of data could be in order to transform how decisions are made. And so, I don't mm -hmm. know, Audrey, what the situation is in Taiwan with regard to thinking about the public servants and especially thinking about uh, uh, is there a need for a new skill set that mm -hmm. uh, can uh, um, develop a more data-driven kind of decision-making? And, and perhaps that's something that you've worked on as well. Yeah, uh, we're now currently working on the uh, second term of Dr. Tsai Ing-wen's presidential terms, our uh, digitalization plan. And okay. there's four pillars that correspond to the new skills that we would like to share within the public sector. And the four pillars, uh, which spells DG, by the way, uh, are digitization skills, innovation skills, governance skills, and inclusion skills. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and these are the kind of four pillars around really anything around digitalization, not just data. But of course, data is a, a sure part of all the four pillars. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, I think it's important to understand that there's different lens going on here. And instead of just buying into a particular lens, for example, innovation and inclusions uh, perspective, uh, I think it really pays to make sure that we can take all the sides. Like when there is a um, need, for example, for people to share um, their uh, data around their symptoms, uh, mm -hmm. which is what we are seeing in COVID. Um, there's this innovation uh, branch that says uh, they want to have access to as much insights as possible across uh, as much uh, medical screenings as possible so that they can, for example, train a assistive intelligence uh, to tell whether one is COVID positive just by looking at a x-ray scan or some sort of other scans as that is of course something that's never been done and so you need a lot of new uh, sometimes raw data and that's the innovation branch uh, but then the inclusion branch uh, would say what we really need uh, is to include more community practitioners uh, into understanding how this virus works uh, and empower them with not only communication material but also affordable devices such as mask and soap and, uh, you know, alcohol uh, hand sprays and uh, temperature checks and um, infrared and things like that, which individually doesn't reduce uh, the R value that much, but when all composed together may have a actually higher impact on the R value containing compared to any one single magic AI technology. So, so that's a different branch of arguing. And I think within the government, De depending on their ministry, because every ministry represents a different value, they already can instinctively argue from one of the four pillars or more. <laughs> but the point of presidential hackathon is to empower people to work within their own ministry with different professionals and also across different ministries and with municipalities and cities and also with the social and private sector. And so all the top 10 teams in this year's presidential hackathon are cross sectoral uh, and we coach them to have at least one person from the social, one person from the private and one person from the public sector so that they can look at the same thing, but from three very different perspectives. Of course, um, they participate in the hackathon that digitization is kind of a given, uh, but that's the point. Uh, and so um, I would argue that uh, we use problem-based learning, look uh -huh. at real-world problems instead of training problems, which tend to be oversimplifying, and then uh, check all the four pillars and see that their stakeholders are present and uh, swap their um, positions until they can argue at each and every side from each and everybody's uh, positions. That's very interesting because, um, um, and, I, and I do like uh, the problem-driven uh, uh, approach because one of the areas also that we are looking into around open data is to become more purpose-driven as opposed to supply-driven. Mm -hmm. uh, because we've seen a lot of the uh, uh, open data use cases uh, were use cases that started from the data. Oh, now we have access to data. What can mm -hmm. we do with the data as opposed mm -hmm. to actually have a clear understanding of what are some of the problems that uh, uh, are crucial to address and what's the potential on them using data to really uh, address that problem. Uh, so, so tell us a little bit about how problems are being defined because that's already mm -hmm. quite often where uh, uh, lack of uh, uh, certain groups of society to actually be able to play a role in the agenda mm -hmm. setting. 
Um, mm. So how, how does this happen within, uh, uh, for instance, mm, the yeah. hackathon, but also within yeah, your, uh, of your branch? Yes. Yeah. The presidential hackathon begins uh, with uh, a long, like a multi-week period of a, a wishing pool where people can just type in whatever they wish uh, to see happen. Uh, and uh, the only thing we require is that they need to label their wish with one of the seven, one or more really, but one of the seven sustainable development goals. And so from SDG 1, uh, which is a problem that really needs to be solved, uh, which is um, no poverty, <laughs> like we need to solve poverty, <laughs> and, and two, which is to solve hunger, uh, and then third, uh, which is to ensure health, and fourth, education, uh, and so on, I can go on. And so all those 17 are already well-established vocabulary of talking about world-scale problems. I mean, that was what everybody agreed back in 2015 as the 17 most important topical areas to work on for the next 15 years. And so it's a good taxonomy, and we just use that. Uh, and so you can uh, type anything. For example, people would say, oh, um, I wish that people in cultural institutions such as museums uh, who visit, and if they have blindness or have a, a difficulty in seeing things, I wish anything that sighted people can see gets translated into voice uh, narration so that people can enjoy uh, the same sort of uh, immersion into cultural events uh, and uh, exhibitions. So, so that's a very concrete idea. And it can be filed, of course, um, under reducing inequalities or under uh, sustainable education or things like that. And so once they do so, uh, then uh, we make sure that people frame these questions in a way that could be solved by data. Uh, mm -hmm. And so um, any team can then uh, propose, oh, I'm going to tackle this wishing pool uh, idea, this one, this one, and this one, and turning those very vague uh, ideas into very concrete data collaborative blueprints. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, there's uh, some uh, frontline um, workers, uh, public servants uh, in the Ministry of Culture who think it's a really good idea, but they did not have, for example, the means to produce or to host a lot of such data. And so they would write a blueprint and identify the missing stakeholders and the missing uh -huh. uh, professionals that's needed to make this data collaborative a reality. For example, you need to have museum actually collaborating, right? If they keep saying that uh, whatever our visual data uh, is proprietary and uh, we would not allow remixes, and that's a non-starter. Um, is the connection still going? Audra, you're frozen for the moment. Are we back? I think we're back. Okay, so I'll redo that segment. So, yeah. So, for example, <laughs> uh, for example, uh, a, a public servant um, of a frontline worker in the Ministry of Culture would say, oh, it's a great idea. And because of my expertise, I know exactly what needs to happen. Uh, the museums need to share their visual data. Uh, the narrators uh, need to be uh, using this pipeline so that they can narrate for one blind person, but it's being recorded and it's remixed and hosted here so that people can then uh, use a phone to access that previous narration and maybe comment on it and so on, but they did not uh, have the um, expertise uh, which the private sector would provide on the technical parts of the data pipeline, nor do they have the uh, connection to mobilize a lot of narrators and people with blindness uh, to try out and uh, absorb this first batch of materials into something useful, uh, data veracity work, basically. Uh, and so the presidential hackathon um, people would just coach her uh, to work with uh, the larger pool of talents, often uh, by people who proposed their own solutions but did not make to the top 24. Uh, and then we repurposed those free radicals uh, into um, a, a new team uh, that would uh, ensure there's co cross co uh, sector collaboration and that they would be able to build their uh, minimally viable product for demoing to the president uh, within the couple of months. Wonderful. Um, Great, and I'm sensitive to your time, so I, I'm, I'm moving on to the last question, uh, 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 Audrey, which is, um, if you would have, um, or basically the last question is, if you would prioritize making progress with regard to what we discussed, uh, uh, both in terms of 
uh, increasing the use of open data, but also increasing data responsibility, data equity, and ultimately mm -hmm. moving into a data collaboration as default position as mm -hmm. opposed to an afterthought. So what would be your what priority that you would mm -hmm. tackle uh, um, one or more uh, that you feel could be transformative if we manage mm -hmm. to actually get that uh, established? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would focus on data competence. Uh, and that is like media competence. Um, it's a term that we use in our K-12 curriculum that is um, default uh, starting from the first grade uh, and that's why we have so many primary school teachers uh, hosting air boxes because that's a great way to teach data mm -hmm. competence uh, and by competence I don't mean literacy uh, we use that term competence for media uh, specifically because we do not want our children's feel that they're merely media literate that they are only consumers of media, consumers of data, consumers of digital creative products. I would like uh, them to think that they are producers, and they really are. I mean, many of them have more Instagram followers than I do, so obviously they are media producers. Uh, and if they host um, their own airbox, it's like stewardship, right? They have to steward over uh, the veracity, the, the truth of the data, like it's not uh, being blocked by a high humidity spraying device in front of it, uh, or things like that. And they have to really think about the contribution they're making, the trade-offs they're making of uh, hosting more devices uh, versus strategically placing devices and so on. And once they think from a producer's uh, point of view, then they are in a position to negotiate. And that is what the data democracies uh, or data co cooperatives, data coalitions, data unions, there's many ways to describe the same thing, which is that there's a huge amount of uh, data being produced by a huge amount of producers. Can they uh, bond together and instead of relying on uh, a single arbitrator uh, to, to um, pull all those data and benefit all from it without giving anything back, uh, which is like, I don't know, um, corporations before the invention of uh, cooperatives and labor unions, uh, we would in, indeed treat uh, this airbox uh, as um, our means of producing data and look at it from a producer's perspective and form new forms of organizations, associations, um, co-ops, you name it, uh, that can collaboratively determine where the data goes uh, how does it protect not only our interests, but our community's interests and how to work with the best or at least better practices that's coming out from GovLab. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Audrey. This was uh, brilliant. Always a uh, delight to talk to you. Always very inspiring and uh, definitely uh, uh, provides for a lot of uh, material to deepen and, uh, uh, and explore further during our summer and ultimately what we believe is the third wave of open data. Thank you so much. Thank you and live long and prosper. <laughs>